Hey everyone, welcome back. Today we're going to tackle atrial fibrillation, AFib, you know. And we've got a really great brochure someone sent us, plus an article from the Heart Foundation should be interesting. Yeah, this will be good. Lots to unpack with AFib, but we can definitely break it down. Totally. So imagine your heart's like this perfectly running engine, mm -hmm. then bam, it's all out of whack, rhythm's off. Yeah. That's kind of what AFib's like, right? Exactly. It's those upper chambers, the atria. Instead of a nice, steady contraction, they kind of just... That's quiver. Quiver. Okay, that doesn't sound good. Not really, no. It messes up the blood flow, and that's where things get risky. And it's surprisingly common, too. This Heart Foundation article said it's like 2% of people. Yeah, around there. And it gets more common as we age, unfortunately. So, not just a random thing, then. We should probably pay attention. But hold on, before we even get into the nitty-gritty, there are different types of AFib. I thought it was all the same. Ah. <sighs> See, that's where it gets tricky. The article breaks it down into three main ones, like stages almost. Oh, so it can get worse. That's not what I wanted to hear. Well, it can progress, yeah. It starts with paroxysmal AFib. That's the come and go kind. Okay, so like episodes. Exactly. It could be super short or last like a week even. Then you've got persistent AFib. That one's more, well, not persistent. It doesn't really go away on its own. And then there's the third kind. Right, and that's yeah. the permanent AFib. Heart just doesn't go back to that normal rhythm. Manageable, but... You know, it's oh, there. So how do you even know you have it? What are the, like, red flags? Oh, lots of things. The brochure lists some of the classics, like heart palpitations. Oh, those are the worst. Feels like it's going to beat out of your chest. Yeah, exactly. Then there's the fatigue, dizziness. Wait, dizziness? Seriously? Yeah, that lightheaded feeling can definitely be a symptom. But the article also mentions some sneakier stuff, like chest discomfort or trouble exercising the way you used to. See, that's what worries me, the not-so-obvious stuff. Like, how do you know if it's just you being out of shape or, you know, your heart acting up? That's why it's important to, you know, listen to your body. And if something feels off, get it checked out. Don't ignore those signs. Okay, that's good advice. So what causes this whole AFib mess in the first place? Well, that's the million-dollar question, isn't it? Sometimes it's clear-cut, other times it's a head-scratcher. But some usual suspects pop up. Okay, like, well, give me the rundown. Well, high blood pressure is a big one. That comes up a lot, both in the brochure and the article. Makes sense, putting all that extra strain on your heart. Right, exactly. Then you've got things like coronary heart disease, problems with your heart valves. Wait, really? Those little flaps can throw off your whole rhythm. They sure can. And it's not just those. Obesity, family history, even having surgery can increase your risk, according to the Heart Foundation. Wow, okay. So basically, a whole bunch of things to watch out for. But it's not just like medical stuff right i swear i read something about everyday habits playing a role too oh absolutely stress caffeine even not getting enough sleep can be triggers for some people no way so that extra cup of coffee in the morning could actually be messing with my heart yeah okay this is getting serious it's all about balance right what works for one person might be a trigger for another and speaking of triggers let's talk about everyone's favorite alcohol Ooh, yeah i was wondering about that is it a hard no if you've got AFib? Well, it's not so simple. The sources say moderate drinking might actually be okay for some people, but binge drinking, that's a different story. So like a glass of wine with dinner is probably fine, but maybe skip the tequila shots. Got it. Exactly. It's all about listening to your body and of course, talking to your doctor. They can help you figure out what's right for you. Right, always good advice. So we've covered what it is, the types, the triggers, but what happens if you do get diagnosed with AFib? Is it something you just learn to live with or are there treatments? That's the big question, right? And good news is it is manageable, AFib, mm. especially if you catch it early, makes a huge difference. Okay, that's reassuring, but manageable. Yeah. What does that actually look like? Are we talking lifestyle changes, meds? What's the deal? Well, it can be a whole combo platter, honestly. Both these yeah. sources, they highlight how it's often a multi-pronged approach, you know? Mm. Medications are usually the first line of defense, though. Makes sense. So what, like heart pills, beta blockers, all that jazz? Sometimes. But blood thinners are a huge E in the AFib world. Remember how we were talking about stroke risk? Right, right, because the blood's not flowing right, can pool and clot dangerous stuff. Exactly. And if a clot breaks free, heads up to the brain.stroke city. Blood thinners, they make it less likely to clot in the first place. So it's all about keeping things moving smoothly. You got it. But here's where the brochure gets real. You got to have an open line with your doctor about these blood thinners. Side effects, right. Those can be gnarly. Yep. 
and everyone reacts differently to meds. Plus, blood thinners, they can interact with other stuff you're taking, even some foods. It's it's tricky. So it's not as simple as just popping a pill and calling it a day. Nope, definitely not. Got to be proactive, ask questions, advocate for yourself. Knowledge is power, right? Always good <laughs> to remember that. But beyond the medication, is there anything people can do themselves lifestyle-wise to help manage AFib? I feel like both sources really stress that. Oh, 100%. It's empowering, actually, knowing you've got some control, even with a heart condition. Mm -hmm. The usual suspects are all there. Healthy diet, exercise. Easier said than done for some of us. True, true. But even small changes add up. Don't think of it as deprivation. Think of it as like giving your body the good stuff it needs to function right. I like that. Positive spin. Now, what about everyone's favorite topic, got alcohol? We already touched on it as a potential trigger, but... Is it totally off limits with AFib? It's not so black and white. That Heart Foundation article, it suggests moderation might be okay for some, but again, individual. Got to see what your doc says. So maybe hold off on the three martini lunches. Yeah. Got it. But what really stuck with me was both sources talking about stress and sleep. Like, those are huge. Right. That mind-body connection, can't ignore it. And yeah. it's not just about triggering AFib, but overall heart health, too, you know? It's all connected, huh? Totally. Meditation, good sleep hygiene. Those can be just as important as any pill in some cases. Wild. Okay, so we've covered meds, lifestyle stuff. What about those more intense treatments? I'm thinking of that catheter ablation the brochure mentioned. Sounded kind of freaky, honestly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that one stuck with me, too. Threading a catheter up through a blood vessel. Yikes. Intense, right. But it's becoming more common for AFib, especially when meds alone aren't cutting it. So for those of us who aren't cardiologists, Break it down what actually happens during this ablation thing. Basically, they take this thin tube, the catheter, and thread it through a blood vessel, usually near the groin. Groin, huh? Okay, that does sound a bit unpleasant. They numb it up, don't worry. Plus, they use imaging to guide it, so it's precise. The catheter goes all the way up to the heart. Like a tiny little electrician going in to fix the faulty wiring. Perfect analogy. Once it's in place, the catheter delivers radio frequency energy, sometimes it's even extreme cold, to a very specific spot on the heart muscle, the spot causing those wonky electrical signals. And that fixes the rhythm. That's the goal. Creates a little scar, basically, that blocks the abnormal signals and lets the heart beat normally again. Wow, science is wild. But that sounds like major surgery. What's recovery like after something that intense? The brochure was a little vague on the details, but it did say most people go home the same day or the next. Oh, wow. Didn't expect that. Yeah. But surely there's some downtime, restrictions afterwards. Definitely something to chat with your doc about. But usually it's taking it easy for a few days. No strenuous stuff while you heal. Might be some temporary limits, like on driving. Depends on your situation. No marathon running right after heart surgery. Got it. But the whole point is to help folks get back to their normal lives, right? Exactly. It's not a magic bullet ablation, and there are risks, like any procedure. But for many with AFib, it's a game changer. Big quality of life improvement. That's amazing. Medical tech these days blows my mind. Yeah. But it does make you wonder. Like, we've talked about how AFib often goes hand in hand with other heart stuff, high blood pressure, valve issues. So is treating just the AFib enough? Mm-hmm. Or do those other things need attention to? Ah, uh, the million dollar question. It's rarely that simple, unfortunately. It's more like everything's connected, right? A whole web of heart stuff. Mm. So you got to treat the whole thing, not just one symptom in isolation. Exactly. Like if someone's got AFib ND high blood pressure, getting that BP down can make a world of difference, not just for their heart in general, but could even mean fewer AFib episodes. Two birds, one stone. Got to love that. But it made me think, too, both these sources mentioned the, like, emotional side of AFib, not just the physical. Oh, absolutely. That's huge and often overlooked. It can be scary dealing with a heart condition. For sure. The fear of triggering an episode, the I don't know, limitations it might put on you. It's a lot to process. Definitely. And, you know, it's okay to not be okay. Seeking support, that's not weakness, that's strength. Exactly. Lean on your people. Find a support group. Knowing you're not alone in this, that's huge. Couldn't agree more. And it kind of ties back to what you were saying about lifestyle changes. Got me thinking, what if those changes could actually help prevent AFib in the first place for some people? Ooh, now that is a thought. Shifting the focus from treatment to prevention. Powerful stuff. Right. Even if you don't have AFib right now, making those healthy choices, stress management, good sleep, staying active, that's investing in your future heart health. Love that. Yeah. It's good to be reminded we have some control 
even with something as complex as our hearts. Absolutely. Small steps, big right. changes. Well said. We covered a lot of ground today, diving into atrial fibrillation, from those first signs to some pretty intense treatments. We did. But like with any good deep dive, we're just scratching the surface here. Exactly. We've given you the tools, the knowledge. Yeah. Now it's your turn to explore, ask your doctor the right questions, be your own advocate. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> Thanks for joining us on this deep dive into atrial fibrillation. Until next time, stay curious, everyone.